Hey guys, Woodruff here. So um, now we're going to start moving into, we've talked about all the, what diabetes looks like, the diagnostics, the complications and the crises that can happen. So now we're going to look at the treatments. Um, so there's a lot here. This first video is going to be over insulin and then I'll have a video over oral medications. And then the last one, hopefully, if I'm thinking correctly, will be, you know, other general treatments or lifestyle changes, things like that. So getting close to the end, I think we're on diabetes lecture, maybe five, six, something. Maybe, I feel like we're maybe six. We've only had one interruption from my son so far, um, but video games are going to be taken away soon as he's been playing them for way too long. Um, so just know we may have an interruption and a complaining and um, yeah, you'll get to see how I um, try to be patient. Um, and not lose my crap, um, you know, in this fun, um, almost like reminiscent of quarantine days, um, as we are in an ice storm here in Texas as I record this. Um, so it's so much fun being stuck here for a week at home, um, inside, indoors with a crazy child. So much fun. It's a little time. Hope you all are surviving. Anyway, um, so now let's talk about uh, medical management. So like we've gone over and over and over again, the goal for diabetes is always going to be to keep like a steady blood glucose or keep what's called euglycemia or, um, you know, kind of a steady state. Effectively, we don't want them to have a lot of highs or a lot of lows. Like, you know, it, we want it to be steady. So um, the way that we, because again, like we've talked about higher the blood glucose, the more complications and also low blood glucose can be really serious. So we want to keep things stable. So we, it's not that we want them um, like even like during meal times and stuff, they can have spikes or increases, but we want them to stay as stable as possible throughout the day. Um, so we can keep things stable with medications like insulin or oral medications. Like I said, we'll talk later about lifestyle changes, exercise and nutrition. And then overall, we want to prevent and manage complications. Um, education is so key for diabetic patients and regular checkups and monitoring. So monitoring, I said that really funny. So let's start talking about insulin. Um, so type one diabetics, like we mentioned before, something to always note about them is they will always need insulin um, because they either have none or not enough. So they're going to be unable um, to, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, they're going to be, they're always going to need something to be able to, some bit of insulin to replace because they don't have enough to sustain them. Otherwise they'd be in a constant state of DKA. So we have to replace what's missing. We're type two diabetics, like we mentioned before, we can do sometimes just diet, exercise, lifestyle changes. Um, some of them just need oral medication. Some of them do need insulin or some of them need a combination of one, two, or all of the above. So um, there's different insulin types. The main, don't worry about this inhale down here, but these are the four main types that we're gonna go over. And this chart may look super scary and super overwhelming, um, but don't get too overwhelmed yet. I'm gonna kind of break down um, what this means, how this, how you can interpret this and how this is going to help you. Um, but effectively, we're looking at our rapid acting insulins, our short acting insulins, intermediate and long acting. And really, you can um, separate these into rapid and short acting. These are like our mealtime insulins. I'm going to give them to help to prevent spikes when someone's eating. Whereas my intermediate and long acting, these are going to be um, used over time um, so that my blood sugar is um, stays steady over time. Um, so kind of think of this as the same stuff as like when we talked about short acting bronchodilators, like the SABAs that help to um, when I'm in acute attack, whereas the um, long acting helps so I don't get so many attacks. Um, so you're going to see me use this as a whole, um, this analogy a lot that I'm either using stuff because it's an acute problem, like rapid and short acting, my blood sugar is going up right now. Whereas intermediate and long acting, that's to help to keep it steady so that it's not having so many chances of spiking so often. So um, you're going to hear me refer to a few different things. I'm going to talk about some of these ins insulins as basal insulins. Think of base, like this is my base to keep my um, insulin kind of uh, my, uh, sorry, I should say my blood sugar levels steady. Um, so this is like what long acting is. So intermediate insulin and long acting insulin helps to sustain my blood glucose over time. So I don't have to use so much rapid insulin. So effectively it's saying like, let's just keep this blood sugar overall. Like it's pretty much, it releases insulin throughout the day so that I don't need so much of the boluses. So basal, this is my base. It keeps my um, blood sugar steady or in a baseline good state. 
Um, then there's bolus insulin. This is also what I referred to in the last slide as mealtime insulin. This is my rapid um, or my um, short acting insulin. And this is mealtime. I'm using this to counteract. There's a sharp increase in my blood glucose when I'm eating meals. Um, so think of this. This is think that we use bowls at mealtime to eat, like to eat our food. So the bolus um, is going to be used at mealtimes in order to help um, with the um, increase in blood sugar from the food I'm about to eat. You're also going to hear the word sliding scale. Now, there are some people that I know that do not think this is a dirty word, um, <clears throat> but this is a word you're going to see on the NCLEX and in other, you know, nursing school exams. Effectively, all I'm referring to here is, is that um, this is, I'm referring to the directions that are given in your doctor's order that say how much insulin to give based on the patient's blood glucose. Now, um, <clears throat> for the people that don't believe in sliding scale, we still use sliding scale in the hospital. It's just the way that we utilize it, it's different. We used to just wait until after someone's blood sugar went up and then we use sliding scale to treat a blood sugar that was already high. We have much better ways because effectively we don't want them to get to the point where they ever are high. We predict and, you know, kind of try to prepare and give insulin ahead of time before they spike. That's the goal. Um, but just know if you ever hear some people that are like, oh, no, that we're, we're not using sliding scale. This is just a general term that uh, the way that I'm using it is, is that it's the directions that, um, prescribe how much insulin is to give like and we'll, we're going to do a practice of this later it'll make more sense but I just want you to understand this terminology um, but I'm not necessarily talking about um, there are much better plans and um, uh, what do you call it um, combination uses of different insulin in order to keep blood sugar stable but um, you can ignore what I'm saying if you're getting confused just as long as you understand these three terms so here's some general tips for remembering insulin. Do not freak out about all the numbers. You want to make sense of these numbers. You can memorize these numbers, but if you don't know what they mean, it doesn't help because it's very unlikely that we're going to ask you a straight up question. When is this insulin going to peak? But we're going to ask you these kind of questions. Um, and it really relates to what I need to do as the nurse, because I can sit there and say like, oh, the peak for NPH is four to 12 hours. Um, but do I know what that means? Okay, so it's peaking, but what's happening? Um, so these are the questions you need to ask yourself as you're doing the, if you're looking at these numbers. Any Anytime you see the action or the onset of an of <clears throat> one of these insulin, sorry, from all the talking, uh, nose starts running and I lose my voice. So when you're looking at the action for insulin, this is telling the nurse when they need to eat. So if the onset or the action of a drug, this is when it first starts working. So for example, for rapid acting, it starts working within 10 to 15 minutes. So this is telling me <clears throat> if this drug starts working in 10 to 15 minutes, I need to get food into their mouth within 10 to 15 minutes of administering this, um, or they can have a sharp decrease in their blood glucose. Um, so when you see action, instead of just seeing it as a number, this is telling you as the nurse, when does this patient need to eat? Um, then there's the peak. So the like the medicine can start working, um, but when is it going to be at its highest um, you know, amount of action. So this is the, the peak is when the client is most at risk for hypoglycemia because the peak is when the medicine is at its highest effectiveness, its most effective state. Um, so this is when it's going to have the most effect on the patient. And therefore, since all insulins, what their main purpose is, is to lower blood glucose, this patient's going to be most at risk for hypoglycemia. So for example, if I have um, <clears throat> a patient that's on MPH, again, I said it peaked, four to 12 hours. Um, it, now, don't worry so much that ends number. You do want to know how long it lasts, but that peak, you want to know when it starts because that's when you're going to need to start um, to uh, monitor for hypoglycemia. So if I'm giving um, NPH at, let's say that I'm giving it at nine in the morning, nine to 10, 10 to 11, 11, 12, 12 to one. So that's one o'clock is when they're going to start to peak. So I need to make sure that the patient is, um, is eating something or um, the other thing I want to look for more importantly is that I'm monitoring their blood glucose and looking for signs of hypoglycemia. Because in other words, the patient may be fine. I give their NPH at 9 a.m., but then come one o'clock, let's say they've eaten lunch, I still need to look for signs of hypoglycemia because this is when they're most at risk. So peak tell, like action tells me when do they need to eat. Peak tells me um, when do I need to be looking for hypoglycemia or trying to prevent hypoglycemia. Um, then duration is how long they're at risk for hypoglycemia. So this is going to tell me, like, for example, some insulins, they don't have a long duration. Um, so that risk of hypoglycemia is going to be less, but other insulins last for longer. So it just helps me to better know, like, how long do I really need to be watching for hypoglycemia in this patient? How long 
could they be at risk for hypoglycemia where I really need to watch those symptoms? So um, effectively, when do they need to eat? When are they most at risk for hypoglycemia? And how long is that risk going to last? Um, so again, look at the bigger picture. Does the patient need to eat soon after getting this insulin? Um, what will the patient be doing when they're most at risk for hypoglycemia? Is it going to be the middle of the night where I need to be worried about, hey, could they get hypoglycemia and be asleep? And maybe I won't notice those symptoms. And how can I, what can I do to prevent that? And you want to think about, will this last a short time or a long time? So let's start getting into these specific types of insulin. Um, so first is rapid acting insulin. So all of these end in log, like Humalog or Novalog. So I say they log in the quickest time. Like I said, the action starts happening. Remember, action or onset. This is um, uh, this means that they work super fast. Awesome, which means like um, they have more flexibility around their uh, uh, what do you call it um, uh, with the meal times. That if someone um, uh, what do you call it, does not have a lot of flexibility, they can take this and, and it can work really quickly. So like, let's say like that you don't know, like maybe you ordered some food, you don't know when it's going to come. Um, you know, you can, once that food comes and you can take your insulin and you only have to wait 10 minutes before you can start eating. Um, so uh, it, it works. That's what the onset is, is pretty quick, which is great. Um, but that also means you need to make sure that they have a tray in front of them within 15 minutes. So they work super fast. So you do need to make sure this is not something you want to give. I um, mean, I'll tell you in real life, you're going to see nurses just give it whenever, before, after, et cetera. But um, in perfect nursing school world, we're supposed to give it um, prior to um, within like 15 minutes prior to when they're eating about. Um, it's going to peak, or in other words, they're at most at risk for hypoglycemia within 30 minutes to three hours. So remember the double threes. Um, and so they're going to, um, we're going to need to keep a close eye on them during that time for hypoglycemia, um, which remember the cold and clammy. I mean, it only lasts up to five hours, which might seem like a long time, but compared to other insulins, it doesn't last as long. And here's some mnemonics, but okay, you've seen all this. So here's a bunch of numbers. What's the big picture? You always have to bring it back to the nurse. Okay, so these work fast and I need to give food to the patient or make sure if it was for me, I would eat within 15 minutes. And it's good for people with not a lot of flexibilities in their meal times. Like we're like, they need to be able to, um, if they don't know when their food's gonna be there, or when they're gonna be able to eat, that they can um, take their insulin and not have to wait a long time before they could start eating. There's also short acting insulin. Um, and this is what's known as regular insulin. Um, and so here's some mnemonics and stuff there. If I'll remind you that this is the only insulin that can be given IV push or through a continuous infusion. Um, so um, with this, um, you know, the, the whole thing with this is it's just very predictable and which is why they use this one. This is the only insulin you should ever see um, give IV push or you should ever see in a continuous infusion. Um, it starts, it starts on setting within 30 minutes, um, uh, but it, uh, what do you call it? Um, and it peaks two to five hours later. Um, so for like it peak, it, the peak is a little bit, is a, obviously later than it is for the rapid acting. So just kind of keeping that in mind, but this one lasts up for eight hours. So what's the big picture here? So we can use it for meal times, but there's less flexibility. So after injecting it, I would have to wait 30 to 45 minutes for best, um, prior to meals for the best results, which some people don't have that time. So it's not though it's not good for those that have really unpredictable meal times. Um, it also has a longer duration of action, which means it has a higher risk for hypoglycemia. So that's the big picture here with short acting. Then the, now, so those both of those, these are our meal times. And nine times out of ten, you're gonna see rapid acting, rapid, rapid acting given, um, but sometimes you're going to see short acting given sometimes too. Um, I've seen a, that's a lot less. Um, uh, usually they're going to get Aspart or Lispro, um, you know, uh, for when they're in the hospital, but they can sometimes get short acting insulin um, and, um, you know, around their meal times and things like that. Usually the time you see short acting is if they need an IV push or if they're going to get the IV infusion. So then we're moving into our long acting. So these are our basal insulins. They help to keep a strong base of a good blood glucose. So here's some um, mnemonics for you to remember. So this one, the onset doesn't matter. So for the intermediate and long acting onset doesn't matter because I am not giving these for meals. So, you know, completely, you know, like kind of put out of your mind. You don't even need to know the onset because it, it doesn't really matter because I'm not giving this and then making sure the patient eats right after. I'm not giving this to prevent a spike in their blood glucose. What I most want to pay attention for intermediate and long acting is going to be their peak and their duration. Um, so, and then we'll talk about with long acting, they don't even have a peak. So you know, it's something very different, but anyway, 
Um, so for intermediate, um, the big the big picture here is that these are not for mealtime. It's a daily maintenance, um, but they peak after four hours. So we're always going to be concerned about what are they doing four hours after I give this, um, you know, making sure that they've either, you know, had some sort of food in between the time I've given this and when they're going to peak um, or that I'm checking their blood glucose more frequently. I'm going to be able to check or look for those signs of hypoglycemia. We always want to prevent hypoglycemia. I don't want to just sit and wait. Like, let's see if their blood sugar gets low four hours later. Later. I want to make sure I'm setting them up for success, um, you know, and, um, you know, trying to make sure they eat something if they can, if we can give them something. Um, but um, as a whole, we always want to think about what are they going to be doing that four to 12 hours after receiving this, uh, making sure that they're not going to have a steep drop. Last but not least, there's what's known as long acting insulin. And now I know I say if they all, if they start with L, they are, um, they last a long time and they never peak. Now those are the um, brand names. Lantus and Levermere are the brand names and you guys have to know the generics, but just so you know, if it helps you in the hospital, because in real life, luckily you get to learn the names that you can actually pronounce. Um, so when it comes to it, um, Lantus and Levermere, um, uh, what do you call it? These are our long acting insulins. Um, the great thing about them, again, don't worry about the onset. The onset does not matter because we are not giving these for the meal times. We are giving these to keep a steady basal control of the blood glucose. There is no peak for these. So this is the one, a lot less risk for hypoglycemia and these can last up for 24 hours. Um, so the only real consideration I have here, big picture, not for meal times, their daily maintenance, and um, the great thing they don't peak. So I'm not saying they're con heavily concerned about, um, you know, the hypoglycemia, but these can't be used alone. I can't just get most patients cannot survive on long acting alone. They need that help with the meal times because what we used to do is again we used to chase blood sugars versus um, you know trying to stay ahead of them, um, but we really don't want to um, you know have to you know work backwards and really, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, try to, you know, try to chase a really high blood glucose versus staying ahead of it. And if we use long acting, it's great. But, um, you know, if I use just long acting, they're still having spikes when they're eating. So that's why usually we use Lantus and then they have a mealtime insulin as well. So how do we know insulin worked? We know insulin worked because their blood glucose is going to de decrease. Um, and um, that's the main thing we're looking for. And like problems we can have, um, you know, the main thing is going to be hypoglycemia, which can, of course, like we've talked about, lead to very serious complications. And then also um, local and skin reactions can occur as well, which we'll talk about some of those here in a second. All right, let's do an application check. So we just learned about a lot of insulins. So how can we apply it to a situation? So this says a nurse administers Humulin N to a client at 2100. So Humulin N, the N there is for NPH. So if we remember that, that's my intermediate acting insulin. And I administered it at 2100 or 9 p.m. Based on this administration, which of the following actions are most appropriate for this client? Now, through this PowerPoint, I've had a lot of most appropriate but it's very good to get used to these type of questions because they're a pain in the butt, but they're going to save you later. Um, this is, I mean, this is life. Like I have to sometimes think about like, okay, there's a lot of things I could do right now, but what's the, probably the best option for me right now um, to help meet this patient's goals and prevent them from having a serious complication. So they've gotten a intermediate acting insulin at 9 p.m. So the biggest things, if we go back and remember what we worried about with MPH is we're not worried about onset because I'm not giving it for meal times, but I'm worried about them having a drop or a hypoglycemic episode four to 12 hours after they've had their um, MPH. So the first option is give the client a nighttime snack, such as peanut butter crackers before bed. So, hmm. Well, I like this because I did talk about, or I remember talking about how I want them to eat something. And I remember the peanut butter crackers, that's good because it's got a carbohydrate and a protein, which can keep their blood sugar stable over time. So if they're going to be peaking in the middle of the night when they're sleeping, it'd be good for them to have a snack before they go to bed. So I like that answer. This is my favorite so far, but I've only gone through the first one. So let's keep going. Says check a blood glucose within two hours of administration. Well, I don't think that's appropriate because um, this this it's not even going to peak um, for four hours. So if I check it two hours later, it's not going to really tell me how they're doing. So I would say that's more unnecessary. It says monitor for signs of hypoglycemia thirty minutes after administration. So um, this is a great time where you can kind of study for something else um, while you're studying for this. So this is not an appropriate answer because, like I said, it takes four hours for them to peak, which to be at risk. But who would this be appropriate for? What kind of insulin does peak? 
30 minutes later. Um, so we're probably going to be talking about like rapid acting insulin here. So remember the, th the double threes, 30 to three hours. So um, I'm going to be monitoring for hypoglycemia in someone with rapid acting insulin after 30 minutes, but not for NPH. So I don't think this one's appropriate. Um, then it says, wake the client up between 2 and 4 a.m. for a snack. Now, while that might be the time that they're going to peak the most, what's more appropriate to give them a nighttime snack before they go to bed or to wake them up to have a snack? And I think what would be most appropriate is to give them a snack before bed that's going to um, help to keep their blood sugar up versus wake them up in the middle of the night and disrupt their sleep cycle to have a snack when they could or could not, you know, get hypoglycemic. So in other words, be proactive versus being reactive. Um, so yeah, so I think A is the best answer here. Now let's talk about insulin storage. Um, so unopened containers of insulin are going to stay in the refrigerator. Um, and once you open them, then you want to keep them out of sunlight. They're usually kept at, well, they're not usually kept, they should be kept at room temperature. We want to avoid any sort of temperature extremes for those vials because it can make them, um, the medication ineffective. Um, I mentioned in another video that these can be used for up to four weeks. Now, these are very expensive and for some people, they want to keep them longer and use them longer, but they really can stop working. I've seen so many patients come in with DKA. They're using expired insulin because they don't want to waste it. Um, it's hard. Like some people, they might need only a couple units per day The vials might have like 100 units in it and so um, if they're only using a couple units per day for 30 days um, I mean that might be 30 units and they still have uh, what do you call it you know a good 70 in that vial and it's so hard but um, you know they have to make sure that they are um, you know not using expired insulin because it may or may not be effective. So how do we give insulin? So insulin is given subcutaneously. We talked about before, only regular insulin can be given IV because it's more rapid and predictable. But why don't we use other routes? Why do we have to do these injections? Well, the GI distract destroys insulin, so we're not going to be able to get it in through our GI tract. Um, if we do it intramuscular, there's lots of blood vessels in the muscles, and so it would be super fast, and it wouldn't be able to sustain over time. The reason we like to do subcutaneous is this is going in the fat, and in the fat, the medication could actually chill in the fat and it allows for a slow sustained release, um, which allows for better blood glucose over time. So in other words, it kind of slowly helps to release this through the fat cells, um, through, slowly release the insulin through the fat cells, which um, helps them, um, the medication to work more effectively and to start to, um, uh, what do you call it, um, especially with the long acting, um, it's so key for it to, it kind of hangs out in the fat cells and slowly gets released um, over time. So there's a variety of injection sites usually you're going to see on the abdomen or the back of the arms are the most common areas used. You can use anywhere there's fat. Some people will do their legs. Just depends on the patient. I always ask them where they want to be injected. Um, but, you know, you want to find somewhere that has some area of fat. And we like to rotate sites, but we'll talk about it. Effectively to administer, we drop the appropriate dose in the insulin syringe. We pull up some air, um, you know, um, inject that needle, um, put that air into the vial, draw up our appropriate dose. Um, we clean the site now. Um, at home, they might not use alcohol swabs to clean their sites, but in the hospital we do. And then we inject the insulin using the insulin syringe or a pen. Um, and we do it at a 90 degree angle. And then um, we want to always put like this person is here putting their safety on um, in order to prevent, um, uh, what do you call it, um, getting stuck. There's also what are known as insulin pens. Um, <clears throat> these are typically used for long acting insulin. And um, they're especially helpful for patients that might have the diabetic um, uh, retinopathy and things like that, um, where they're going to have issues with seeing numbers, like the, the numbers on the little syringes are super hard to see. And these ones, it's a, you don't have to pull up or measure anything. These are also great for people that maybe don't have good hand dexterity, arthritis, other things. All you have to do is attach um, the, um, the needle piece, which is like this. And then you just literally click to how many units that you need and it measures the dose and then you inject you push it into the patient you hear like a click and then you push it with your thumb on the end and it pushes in the medication dose um, teach them to wash their hands um, rotate sites because we don't want to use the same site because it can make the insulin ineffective and we don't want them to exercise the site after administration so if they just gave it in their leg they shouldn't go you know ride a bike or if they you know if they're they shouldn't go exercise their arms if they just gave it in their leg 
Um, if they're extremely thin, we may need to administer at a 45 degree angle, but I'll tell you, this is so rare to find someone who is so skinny that they, we have to do it there. Now type one diabetics, it's possible, but most people have at least a little bit of fat um, that you can use. And know with the sub Q injection, you don't have to squeeze the tissue. Some people do it just because it makes them feel better, um, but you don't have to squeeze the tissue. So it's, if you're looking like, I can't even find anything to squeeze, um, you know, you're just looking to make sure there's at least, um, what do you call them? Some tissue there that, I mean, if they're completely cachexic or like, like zero pounds, you know what I mean? But when I say that, like very, very um, uh, like anorexic, et cetera, then we might have to do the 45 degree angle. But I'll tell you, I've maybe had to do it once in my entire life or seen it done once. Um, we talked earlier about continuous glucose monitoring, which is what we use for a patient who maybe has very labile blood sugar and wants to continuously see what their blood sugar is. We talked about how we can use this in conjunction with what's called an insulin pump. So rather than get constant injections, some patients get what's called an insulin pump, which is where it's like a continuous infusion of insulin over 24 hours. And so um, this is where in, um, this is uh, like a catheter that goes in their sub tissue. It's set to an hourly rate. So there's a basal dose and it's um, um, rapid insulin that's given. So like it would be kind of like being on an insulin drip, but continuously through your sub Q tissue. Um, and so um, effectively they're on some sort of basal dose. And then um, at meal times they can give themselves a bolus as needed. Um, we change that catheter site every two to three days. So it's not just staying there in the same place forever. Cause again, then it could become ineffective. Um, or lead to issues in that tissue there. Um, the great thing about this, it can lead to tighter blood glucose control um, and more flexibilities with meals and activities because like, you know, they're already receiving the insulin. So we're keeping kind of things steady. And then when it's meal times, it's like, okay, hey, I'm having a meal here. Let me give myself some insulin. And it can, um, it's because it's that rapid insulin, they can start eating, you know, right away. Um, disadvantages is that if they have this, they can have a higher chance of hypoglycemia. It's a continuous infusion. So they usually need this in conjunction with a continuous glucose monitor or really frequent glucose checks. Um, it's something that's not you inserted in you. So there's always the risk for infection, especially if, depending on where it's located. And then it's also expensive. So, um, you know, not everyone obviously can afford this, even if they may need it. So we usually reserve this for people that have a lot of issues with blood glucose control or typical methods don't work. So complications. So there's a couple different things that can happen in your tissues with insulin um, when administered incorrectly. So if we use the same site too much, we can have what's called lipodystrophy. And this can happen in two different ways. We can have hypertrophy or thickening of the tissues like in the top here or atrophy or wasting of the tissues in the bottom here. Um, so just recognize that we want to be very careful about the injection sites that we're using, that we're rotating the sites. Um, what most people do is, is that they find like a little quadrant and then they kind of within that quadrant, they kind of use different areas um, within that quadrant. But, um, you know, for me personally, I always usually try to go around like if I got their belly at one time, I try to get the other side of their belly or their arm the next time, um, etc. So but be looking and checking around their skin or their injection sites for these complications. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is a complication of insulin known as there's one called the Samoji effect and then the Dawn phenomenon. But before we do that, we're going to do a true false little game to see what we already know about Samoji versus Dawn, because this is a very confusing concept for many people. Um, so let's see where we're starting at. So where this is a true or false. So statement number one says the only way to differentiate these two complications is to check up, uh, I should say check a blood glucose at, um, between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. So what I know about Samoji and John is this issue with blood sugar being really high in the morning. And I feel like one of them, you have a drop and one of them, you're always kind of high or normal and then you get high. So I feel like this would be correct. That the only way to really know is what's happening in the middle of the night. Are they having a drop in blood glucose or not? So I'm going to say um, yes or true for number one. It'll make more sense when we talk about it. So try not to get too lost. If you haven't studied this yet, this may not make any sense. It will make sense soon. Um, number two, a client with Dawn phenomenon may wake up feeling sweaty in the middle of the night. So I know one of them has hypoglycemia, um, but I feel like it's the Samoji because that's like the so low one. Um, they get really low in the middle of the night. They have like a low blood glucose and then spike and go up. So I feel like this one is false. Um, number three. To help fix a client with Dawn phenomenon, the nurse should give them a nighttime snack. 
So this person, their problem is they're high in the morning, but they never actually have a low blood glucose. This is the dawn person that just in the dawn or morning time, they have this rush of, you know, hormones that leads them to have a high morning blood glucose. So I think if you gave them a nighttime snack, that would just make it even worse. Um, and so um, I'm going to say false to that one too. Number four, to help fix a client with some emoji effect, the nurse may need to talk to the doctor about a decreased nighttime insulin dose. Now this one, this is where they have a drop in the middle of the night and then their blood glucose goes high. So I'm actually going to say yes, because if they get less insulin at night, they're going to have less a chance of hypoglycemia in the middle of the night. Therefore, they're not going to maybe have that same spike in the morning. So I'm going to say true. And then for both Samoji effect and Dawn phenomenon, the patient will have a high blue, blah, 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 high blood glucose in the evening. Um, and so for this one, um, what do you call it? Um, it, I believe that it's partially true, but it's not fully true. So this would be a false statement because for both of them, they'll have a high blood glucose, but it's in the morning, not in the evening. So we have true, false, false, true, false. So yes, hopefully that should make sense when we talk about it now. So there's the Samoji effect and the Dawn phenomenon. Both of these are a high blood glucose in the AM, but they're for different reasons. So what's happening is, I mean, usually in the middle of the night, we're not checking blood glucose, but if, if, if people are waking up in the morning with a really high blood glucose, we want to try to figure out what is going on. So um, what's happening in Samoji effect, and again, from Samoji, you can think so low or so much insulin. What's happening is they're getting too much insulin at night or they're not getting a snack at night with their insulin. So what's happening is they're having a drop in the middle of the night. So in the middle of the night, it's trying to remember, think like NPH, we give it at nine and then around like, um, you know, one, two in the morning, they're starting to have a drop. Um, and what happens is they have hypoglycemia in the middle of the night. What the body's not going to tolerate hypoglycemia. The body's like, uh, 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 sympathetic nervous system. I'm coming to the rescue. So it does a rebound hyperglycemia because the body is compensating for the low blood sugar. It's like, let me release all the stores, get that blood sugar up. So effectively they're, um, what do you call it? Um, this patient, they get their insulin at night. They either don't have a snack or, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, they have too, a too high of a dose of insulin. They have a drop in the middle of the night and then their body rebounds and so they wake up in the morning and they have a high blood glucose. Um, whereas the dawn phenomenon is a little different. Um, this person, they receive their insulin at night. The dose is fine. Doesn't matter if they have a snack or not. Um, but what's happening is, is that in the, um, uh, in the morning time, around three or four in the morning, um, uh, regulatory hormones, like especially this is for people that are adolescents, they re release growth hormone, which shoots up your blood sugar. So these people, what's happening is their blood sugar is shooting up because of a growth hormone release. They never are low. They don't hit a low. They're not hypoglycemic. What's going on here is, is that their blood sugar, we're giving them some insulin, um, but we're not giving them enough to compensate for that big, sharp increase in growth hormone early in the morning. So this patient wakes up high hyperglycemic, but it's because of that growth hormone that was secreted in the middle of the night. So in other words, this patient is never low, um, but you can see like they have in this little mnemonic in this picture, like I had is, is what does the patient need? Cause as the nurse, that's what I need to know. The only way I can tell what's going on is if I check a blood sugar at two to four, if their blood sugar um, in the middle of the night is low, that's a sign they're going low and then rebounding and going up. That has to be some OGs. But if their blood sugar is normal or high in the middle of the night, then that's a sign that they have dawn because that must be the growth hormone shooting it up. If there's no low, it can't be dawn. The only, um, so in Samoji, there's a low in the middle of the night and dawn, there's never a low. There's just this sharp increase because of the growth hormone. In Samoji, there's a low and then a sharp increase because my body's compensating for that low blood glucose. Hopefully that makes sense. The only thing, the other thing you want to consider is that in Samoji's, uh, a Samoji effect that they might have headaches um, on awakening because of the low blood glucose and the sharp increase. Um, they can have night sweats, like the, the um, signs of hypoglycemia or nightmares in the middle of the night as a result of their Samoji effect. So what do we do to fix this? Um, so for Samoji, the issue is, is they're having too much insulin at night or they're not eating a snack. So they either need to have a bedtime snack to counteract that hypoglycemia or to have less insulin. So in other words, Samoji effect, think of what can we do to prevent hypoglycemia? Whereas then we get into Dawn phenomenon, there's no low here. I don't, they don't need more, uh, they don't need less um, insulin. They don't need a snack. What they need is maybe more insulin. I'm pretty much need to compensate for the fact that they're already going to have this 
extra um, growth hormone that's secreted in the mornings, they might need more insulin at night, or we might have to wake them up in the middle of the night and give them insulin, um, you know, in order to keep up with this sharp increase. So effectively, we have to fix it based on what the problem is. Samoji, too much insulin, or not enough snacks. Dawn, not enough insulin, um, or not enough frequently of checking or giving insulin. So um, Dawn, they need more insulin before Dawn. Samoji, they need less insulin or more snacks to counteract that um, low blood glucose. And I think this shows it pretty well. Um, this picture. So with like, imagine this is at night here and a patient gets um, their blood sugar, uh, uh, sorry, their insulin, um, and they have a normal decrease in their blood glucose. But what happens then in the morning is they have that sharp increase because this is where the growth hormone is released. There's no incredible low or dip. This is just a normal decrease in blood sugar as you would have for someone who is receiving insulin or some treatment at night. Um, so, but what's happening is this is not good. This is not a hypoglycemic reaction. All that's happening here is, is that they're having a normal decrease, but then growth hormone comes in and the dawn phenomenon causes it to shoot up um, really high. So they wake up with a really high blood glucose. Whereas with Samoji, they start, you know, their blood sugar is okay. But then what happens is we bottom them out because we gave them too much insulin or they didn't have a snack. And so as a result of that, then they have this counter regulatory or the fancy word for saying my body compensates for the low blood glucose and I wake up again. So see, both of them wake up with the high blood glucose, but the dawn phenomenon, they never have a low. They just have this shoot up of hormones. Whereas Samoji, they have this low drop that ends up with a oh, compensation. Oh, oh no, get back. Compensation increase in, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, increase in uh, blood blood sugar um, to help to fight that that uh, hypoglycemia that happened in the middle of the night. <clears throat> so I think this is the last thing I'm going to do. Okay. Yeah. So before we get to oral meds, this is the last thing I want to show is I want to talk a little bit about sliding scale. So when I talk about sliding scale, it might look something like this. Now, this is just one example I found online, um, but there's a variety of them. So, but this is, might be something you, this is something you're definitely going to have to know how to read in the hospital or how to do. Um, but um, Aside from that, you're also, um, it's, you might have it on a test question, et cetera. So this is a very simple one because we're going to do a carbo carb, uh, carbohydrate counting one soon or later, but it's saying based on the information below, how much insulin should the nurse administer? So um, this, this patient, the order is for a usual scale. So you can see here, there's a sensitive scale, a usual scale and a resistant scale. And to help explain what that is, is that some patients are super sensitive to insulin. So they might start them on the sensitive scale. Um, usual is what most people would need. And then resistant means like you're giving them insulin and they're not responding. So like another words, you can see if I'm sensitive to insulin, I need less insulin. If the usual is about what most people need and resist, it means you're giving me insulin and my blood sugar is still high. So then maybe they need higher doses. Uh, but this patient's on a usual scale and they're receiving an a AC and HS, which means before meals and at bedtime. AC is before meals. HS is before um, bedtime. And here's their blood glucose reading. At 11 o'clock, it was 245. So in order to use the sliding scale, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the blood glucose here on the scale. So my blood glucose is 245. So I'm going to find, it's going to be in here. So it's between 221 and 260, 245 is in there. So I'm going to go over here. Now, it's not going to be this one because this is the sensitive scale. So I'm going to go over until I find the right one. So pretty much like you're matching them and finding the right point from your blood glucose and what scale you're on. Now, usually you're not going to see all three scales. You're just going to have your scale. So just know um, normally you're just going to be looking, okay, what, what number am I? How much insulin do they get? So this patient based on this is going to get B, eight units. It's not going to be four because that's that. It's not going to be six because that would be that kind of blood sugar. And it's not going to be two because that's the wrong scale. So um, you always want to just be looking and making sure that you know how to use these scales or that you're familiar with this um, in order to safely give insulin. Anyway, that is the basics on insulin. I will see you for oral medications. Yes, there's still more. See you soon.